I, I hope that, that you are impacted uh, through this message today. I, I will just tell you up front, I have a ton of content, a lot of things that I want to share with you. In fact, is really, I could, I could do a series uh, of several messages on each of these topics that we're going to cover today, um, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to just kind of hit the highlights uh, a little bit of of the things that we're gonna we're gonna cover. Um, uh, we last week we just kind of broke ground on this series, the unseen, talking about the supernatural, um, and I talked a little bit about the unseen world um, and kind of gave an overview, and it was kind of an intro to to what we're gonna be talking about today. We're talking about eternal destinations. Their, their scripture tells us and is very clear that there is a heaven and there is a hell, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. In the weeks to come, throw that up there, guys, the, the, the uh, next few weeks, we're going to talk about the forces of darkness, Satan and his angels, uh, week four, warriors of light. Um, what, is, what does God's angels look like, and what, what do they do, and how do they interact in, in our lives? Um, we're going to talk about that. And then in week five, the unseen war, um, really going to uh, dive into spiritual warfare and what, what, what uh, Scripture talks about, about that. But today, um, we're going we're gonna to get into um, heaven and hell. Before we do, let me kind of give you our, um, our theme verse for this series. Ephesians 6.12 says this. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Um, So today, let's let's jump into the eternal destinations. Some may say, Jason, why are we talking about this? Especially, why are you talking about hell? I mean, you know, not the greatest of subjects. Here's, Here's why, and this is kind of the... The, the thought that I want you to grasp as we go through um, today. What you believe about eternity determines how you live today. What you think about eternity is going to determine how you're going to live your life today. And so that's why this is so important. It's important to know what does God's word say about these things. Now, there's, there's, there's good news and there's bad news here that we're going to kind of cover today. Um, who wants, who wants the, the good news first? Who, how many of you like getting the good news first? Who likes bad news first? Okay, got some bad news people. They, they want the bad news first. Get it out of the way. Um, here's the deal. We're going to go with good news first. That's how it's in the notes, okay? So we're going to talk about the glory of heaven, the glory of heaven. Here's what I want to do as we kick off. Um, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to read some scripture. To you. So stand with me. Stand, stand up all across the room. Stand with me. Just honoring God's word. Here's the deal. There's no way I can accurately describe heaven. There's no way that I can fully make you understand what heaven looks like. And at, at the end of this message today, afterwards, and you say, Jason... Uh, you, you, you didn't even come close to describing heaven. I would agree with you because this is, there is no way I can fully describe it. But God's word does talk about heaven and it shares some things with us that I think are, are powerful to us that, that we need to grasp. If we get started today, what does God's word say about heaven? So let's honor God's word. Follow along with me. You'll see these scriptures on the screen. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even imagine what God has created for all of us, those that that love him and are called according to his person. John 14 says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is talking here, he's saying, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am in heaven. And then Revelation 21 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed 
for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. That's what God's word says for us who get to enjoy heaven with an incredible loving God. And so as we, as we go through this today, that, that needs to be our picture of, of what heaven is. Let's, let's, as we begin today, let's, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you. God, that your word is incredible. It speaks to us, it challenges us, it, it, it shows us what you want us to know. And God, today, as we receive your word, may we be challenged, but God, may we see a picture of you more clearly than ever before, that you are good, you love us, God, and you want good for us. God, speak to our hearts. God, we thank you for all that you're going to do through this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, turn to somebody next to you, give them a fist bump, say glad to see you today, and then you may be seated. All right, let me, uh, let me jump in today. The, there's a lot that many people may think about heaven. You know, what is it? What does it look like? Um, you know, what are we going to do when we're there? And, and, and they're really... Uh, Unfortunately, there's a lot of misconception. Even in, in churches today, there's misconception about what heaven is and what it's going to look like and what we're going to do. And, and, and I want to I clear some things up just as we begin here talking about heaven and give you some misconceptions about heaven that, that unfortunately many people think. Because here's, here's the deal. So many people just take what so-and-so said about heaven or their ideas or Hollywood movies, what movies say about heaven, and, and, and they're not sure that that's really what they want. And so uh, let, me, let me give you some misconceptions, unfortunately, that are out there, three misconceptions about heaven. Number one is that, that heaven will be boring. There's this thought out there that heaven's just going to be this incredibly boring place. I think many people, you know, they, they've gone to church um, maybe all their lives or whatever, grew up in church and it was boring at church. And so they think God is boring. Therefore, heaven is just going to be boring. And I don't really want that for eternity. That's a long time to be bored. You know what I mean? And so th that's, that's a, a common misperception. And this is completely false. Heaven, heaven will not be boring. And here's some things that scripture tells us for sure, there's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot that we will find out when we get there about heaven. But here's some things that we do know absolutely about heaven. Number one, we will know one another and we will be loved. Uh, we will love and be loved. We're going to see people in heaven that maybe we haven't seen for a long time. We're going to recognize them. We're going to love on them and, and be loved by them. We're going we're to be able to recognize people maybe that we've read about in Scripture and see them and know who they are and be able to go up to them and say, Man, David, what was it like when you faced Goliath? And you slung that stone and, and knocked him out. How incredible was that? Moses, when you parted, you know, when you walked through the parted Red Sea and, and led the children of Israel through it, what was that like? You know, you, you ladies, um, you know, if you had a difficult childbirth, you could go up to Eve and say, what the heck? You know, I mean, <laughs> we, here's the deal. We're going to know people. We're going to recognize, and they're going to know you, and you're going to be loved, and you're going to be able to love those who you see there. It's, it's going to be phenomenal. I think there will be 
just a, a phenomenal amount of time of just spending time with people and, and, and seeing them and, and celebrating with them and, and d- continuing to develop that relationship. Um, here's the second thing. Heaven will be a place of unimaginable beauty. Incredible beauty. You can't imagine how, how lovely, how awesome, how cool it is. I, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough to be able to see some pretty cool stuff here on earth. Um, I've traveled some. I've, I've been to Alaska and seen some beautiful snow-capped mountains and, and, and some different uh, things like that and bald eagles flying around and all that kind of stuff. And it was beautiful in Alaska. I've been to the Grand Canyon and seen that. Incredible. I've been to Niagara Falls and seen that. Um, seen some, some pretty cool stuff. But here's the deal. Nothing compares. It doesn't compare. Not even close to what heaven is going to be like. The, the, the most spectacular views and, 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 and panoramic vistas that you've seen can't compare to what heaven is going to look like. In heaven, here's the third, in heaven you will see Jesus face to face. Uh, what is that going to be like? To be able to just stand before Jesus, the person who gave his life for us. How incredible is that going to be? To, to see him face to face. It's, it's going to be awesome. You will have new and perfect bodies. Come on, can I get an amen on that one? Woo! I'm going to be six foot tall. No, no six one, over six foot. I'm going to need to six, six one, okay? I'm going to have a full thick head of hair. Jen's going to put her fingers through it and all this kind of stuff. My kids are just threw up in their mouth over here, so... <clears throat> It's going to be incredible. Um, we're going to have new glorious bodies, you know. I won't have one ab. I'll have a six-pack, you know. It's going to be cool. Um, new and perfect bodies. Uh, heaven is the absence of everything bad, painful, and evil. It's the presence of everything good, holy, and glorious. It, it's, it's perfection is what it is. And we get to be there we get to partake in it it's going to be incredible to be in heaven whatever you can imagine whatever you can imagine and think of and and think about what is good whatever you can imagine heaven is better it's better than what you can even think of here's the here's the the second misconception is that this world is your home that that Everything that, that you have and want in life, you, you can find it here on earth. And, and it, this is our home. This is, this is everything that, that, that there is. It's all that's good. And, and this, is, this is where we are and this is what we need to enjoy. Um, people uh, who, who don't know Christ may have this, this mindset. Philippians 3, 19 says this. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is where? Is where? In heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's not this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see, the things unseen, will last forever. Heaven's going to be there. For, it, it, it's for, forever. And we get to, to partake in that. Those of you who have received Christ, made him Lord and Savior, invited him, him into our life, we get to partake of heaven. It's going to be incredible. Incredible. Here's the third misconception is that most people, most people, they're, they're going to heaven anyway. I mean, pretty much everybody's just, everybody's pretty much going to heaven. That's a misconception, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And why is this mindset so dangerous? Because if, if everybody's pretty much going to heaven, then, then I don't really have any responsibility to do what Jesus said, which is go and make disciples, go reach people, go and make a difference. That, that really doesn't carry any weight because most people are going to heaven anyway, right? It, it, it's, it's a misconception. And here, here's the thing that we need to understand. If, if, if I were the devil, what would I want more than anything, especially of, of believers, of Christians? I would want you to think that there's really not any urgency. There's really 
nothing that we, we have to, to, to work towards. Everybody's probably going to go to heaven, and it's going to be boring anyway, so it's, it's not really that big a deal. Don't worry too much. Just enjoy life. Just enjoy life and get the most out of this world because really it's, it's the best. If I were Satan, that's what I would try to do, is try to get people to misunderstand what Scripture really says about heaven. Because what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. There's, there's so many things that we can, we can miss and, and others can miss. Maybe even loved ones can miss with this kind of misconceived thought that, you know, most people are going to go to heaven and, and it's just going to be okay. And I don't, I don't have to live like Jesus wanted me too much because, you know, God wouldn't do that. He was not going to send anybody to hell. Everybody pretty much is going to get in. Unfortunately, that's just not what Scripture communicates. There, there, there's something we need to understand and realize is as glorious as heaven is, is, there will be those that miss out on just an incredible eternity with God. And, and, and we need to grasp the reality of that. Now, because of time, let me, let me jump to the next thing that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the horrors of hell. And I want to, I want to, I want to tell you that why we're talking about this is, is, is important because we need to grasp it. We need to understand what God's Word says about hell. Now, let me give you some statistics. 74% of Americans believe in heaven. So, three-fourths. But only four in ten believe that those that reject Christ spend eternity in hell. And get this, only half of one percent, point five percent of people believe that they personally might go to hell. You see, hell is reserved for the really, really bad people, the murderers and rapists and terrorists and those, those kind. That's the only people that are going to hell. But here's what Scripture actually says. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says this. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Now understand, this is Jesus talking, okay? It goes on, but small is the gate and narrow the road, that leads to life, and only a few find it. That's, that's unfortunate. And understand, that's not God's heart, but that's the reality, is that there is the possibility that many may miss out on what God has created for all of us. If I were the devil, I would want to convince you that there is no help so don't take it seriously. There really isn't anything to worry about. I, I would want especially believers to think that, listen, it, it's, it's not worth, you know, really putting much thought into. It, you just just kind of live however you want. If I can convince you that, that there's no hell, then people will, will kind of do their own thing. They'll justify their sin. They'll reject Christ and really have no fear or reverence of God. Believers, believers will live ridiculously self-centered lives, all focused on them and what they do. They'll idolize comfort. They'll reject sacrifice. They'll avoid any type of persecution. They will love this world more than life and they will rarely share anything with those in need. If I were the devil and I could convince you that there's really nothing to worry about and just, just, just live in joy, then we would really miss out and we would live not in a way that God would necessarily want. But here's what we need to understand. Hell is a very real place. It's a very real place. Now, why does it exist? Why does hell exist? It's, some, it's, it's a fair question. It's a good question. And it's a question we need to know and we need to understand. Here's why hell exists. Number one, hell exists 
for God to deal righteously with Satan. You see, God at, at, at some point is going to deal with Satan and he is going to be thrown into the eternal lake of fire hell and, and that's where he will reside forever and he will deal with Satan at the appropriate time. Now, unfortunately, so many of us have kind of a distorted view of, of Satan and we're going to get more into this next week. But so many people think, you know, Satan is just, he's just kind of this harmless little guy in a red suit sitting on my shoulder, you know, with a pitchfork and horns. Unfortunately, he, he, he's much more than that. Much more than that. Behind every addiction, every abuse, every fear, every pain, every shame is Satan himself. He is the embodiment of evil. He is called in scripture the destroyer, the deceiver the dragon, the dark angel, the serpent. He is our adversary, our enemy, the tempter, the wicked one, the thief. He is the father of lies, the prince of darkness, the angel of the, the abyss. He is the one who steals joy, kills faith, destroys health, ruins your finances, obliterates marriages, and takes our kids captive or wants to. That is who Lucifer, Satan, or the devil, the enemy of our soul, that's who he is and that's what he does. He is very real. Hell is very real. But I'm thankful because we know that God will deal with him justly, righteously at the appropriate time. Revelation 10 or tw uh, 2010 says this, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Why does hell exist? So that God can deal with Satan appropriately, the way that he is supposed to and will. Here's the second reason and the second thing of why hell exists. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. Wait a second, you, you mean there will be people that go to hell? Listen, that, that, that's, that's so unfair, Jason. There, there, there's no way you can't do it. You mean that God's actually going to send good people to hell? You, you, what about my neighbor? I, I like my neighbor. I actually like this neighbor that I've got. They, they, you know, they make me brownies and they're good brownies. You can't send somebody who makes good brownies to hell. They, they, they watch out for, you know, my dog when he gets out and they, you know, they just, they're good people. And I get that. And I understand the concern with that. And I understand, you know, that the argument behind that. But the problem is, is that those same people who, who complain and, and, and argue about the, the, you know, God not sending someone would in the same way be extremely indignant about something here on earth, about a wrongdoing that, that, that someone did, and they would say someone needs to be punished for that wrongdoing. If something happened and some, someone was wrong, somebody needs to pay for that. Somebody needs to be taken. There needs to be justice. Right? Here's the deal. God is a just God. And unfortunately... There will be those that will face his justice. And because of sin, because of wrongdoing, our, our punishment and what we deserve is, is really hell. It's, it's, it's hard for us to understand, but we have, to, we have to realize that God is a holy God and he is a just God. He made a way of escape from the sin that we find ourselves in. And some people would say, well, we're, we're good people. We're good people. You know, they're good people. There's, there's, that's, that's, that's a real flaw of understanding. And really, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing that, that our society has kind of moved towards. And it can be very dangerous to think that, well, we're good people. No, listen, we are naturally sinful people. 
We are naturally not good people. I mean, it's the reason we have to teach our kids to be good, right? You don't have to teach them to be bad. They do that pretty good on their own. We have to teach them the things that are right. We have to teach them how, how to be good, how to live, how to share. I mean, you don't have to have, you don't have to have, you know, hey, we're going to learn today to be selfish. No, we, you don't have to teach that. It comes naturally. We're naturally sinful people. And, and because of that, God made a way for us to be redeemed from our sin. And it's through Jesus. He gave, sacrificed, willingly gave his only son so that we could be redeemed from the sin that we're naturally in and so that we could know a relationship with God and thus receive heaven as our eternal reward. However, there are those that, that will decide not to accept that. And because God is a just God, a holy and just God, and we would want a God to be a just God, there will be justice at the end. And unfortunately, there will be consequences to our choices and whether or not we choose Christ or not. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9 says this, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. That is very real. That is very true. It's very sad, but it's, it's, it's true. And it's not what God wants for anyone, because Scripture's clear on that. But that is the truth of God's Word. And we need to realize what God's Word actually says. Listen, listen this, this, this is no fun to talk about, and I'm sure it's no fun to hear about either. But if we don't accept the reality of hell, we will never truly appreciate the glory of the gospel and why Jesus came to restore us back to a relationship with God, to free us from our sin so that we can stand before God holy and righteous and receive heaven as our reward. Now, let me, uh, let me give you just a quick glimpse, real quick, of, of, of hell. Here's what, here's what Luke chapter 16 says. It tells a story uh, about a rich man and a, and a poor man named Lazarus. Here's what it says. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, when Jesus said this, Jesus is telling this story. A lot of people are hearing this. When Jesus said this, is, this rich man was dressed in purple, listen, they would understand this guy is rich. He's, he's filthy rich. He's Kardashian rich, okay? Some people get that, understand. He's rich. He, if, if, if you dressed in purple, you were the rich of the richest. If you had fine linen, they would understand that, that fine linen, uh, one commentary said that fine linen, you could sell fine linen and it would cover a year's wages for an average person. Okay, so they would understand this when uh, he was saying this. It goes on. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. He was at the, the gate of this rich man because maybe he would, you know, give him a little bit here and there. He was covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Now, the, a lot of times we think that's just little bitty crumbs or whatever. You have to understand the context uh, of this time and what took place. See, people that were Kardashian rich, super, super rich, what they would do, because they didn't have like napkins and stuff, and that's, they would actually wipe their hands and their mouth with pieces of bread. So they would take these, these slices of bread, they would wipe their hands and their mouth with multiple pieces of, of bread and then throw them on the ground. Oftentimes they would be scooped up by the servant and thrown out to the dogs to eat. That's what this is talking about. He wanted to get some of what fell from the rich man's table. It goes on. 
The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. I talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, before Jesus came, died on the cross and all that, people that, that died under the law, that, that honored God, served God, lived by the law, went to a place called Abraham's bosom, Abraham's side. Okay? And then there was this large chasm that separated Abraham's bosom from Hades, or some, the Old Testament calls it Sheol. Okay? In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up, talking about the rich man, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus, by his side. So you've got Lazarus across over here with, with Abraham, and you got uh, the rich man in Hades. So he, he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Okay? So Hades or Sheol was a temporary place where people who were wicked or who didn't follow God's commands went during this time. This is not the same as hell because the other scripture says that Hades will actually be thrown into hell, okay? But it was a type of hell, just like Abraham's bosom was a type of heaven, but it wasn't, it wasn't heaven, okay? Um, and so uh, the, the translation here of, of hell uh, or uh, is this word that Jesus used. It's called Gehenna. Gehenna comes from uh, the valley of Hinnom, and it means a place of everlasting punishment. Jesus used this word multiple times, and there was actually this place near Jerusalem that was called Gehenna, and it was a place just outside of South Africa where they would throw all the, the dead animals and all the nasty stuff that, that uh, would, would die or whatever that they wanted to get rid of and they would throw all this, this stuff. There was uh, maggots, worms, burning flesh. The smell was beyond sickening from what we understand. And it was a, a, a picture of what hell was. That's why Jesus used it multiple times in, refer, in, in reference to this. One commentary says it was the land of no more good. No more beauty, no more laughter, no more peace, no more friendship, no more joy, no more hope, no more second chances. That's what Jesus himself said about hell. That was the, the connotation. Now, let me wrap up this story, Luke 16, 27 and 28. Abraham answered, or excuse me. The rich man answered. He said, "He answered because Abraham said, no, there's a great cabin. I can't, we can't, you can't, I can't send Lazarus to you. So he answered and he said, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Unfortunately, you can read the story. Abraham said, I, I can't do that. There's no way that he can leave this, this place. Let me, let me give you four quick lessons from the other side, from what scripture tells us about hell. Number one, the rich man was fully conscious and aware. He understood what was going on. He still had memories. He knew who Lazarus was. He had great pain, and probably the, the greatest pain was the pain of regret at how he had lived his life. And you see this in, in, in this story. Here's the second thing that we know. The rich man's eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. There's no changing it. He was there and there was nothing that could be done from it at that point, at that time. It was too late. It, it, he couldn't say, you know, some prayers. He couldn't call out to Abraham. He couldn't say, you know what, I'm changing now. It's there. Now let me come into heaven. Maybe after I spend just a little while down here and, and, and you know, I realize how wrong I was, then maybe I can. At that point, 
there's nothing that could change where he was. Here's the third thing. The rich man knew that his suffering was just. Now, he, he asked that, that the pain could be taken away. Maybe, can I just a little bit of, uh, you know, just reprieve, give me a little bit of water or something to, to take away this, this pain just even for a moment. But there was never any complaint that why he was there wasn't just. In his own mind, it seemed as if it was fair, the punishment that, that, and it, that it was deserved. Here's the fourth thing. The rich man begged and pleaded for someone to help his brothers know Jesus. He was concerned. He, he, he knew what, what his brothers and how they were living, and he wanted something to change for them. If you read the story, here's what Abraham says. They have the law and the prophets. They have God's word. It's out there. They have the ability to be able to choose God if they want to. There are some things that we need to, we need to understand about this and take from this. That, unfortunately, there are those, Jesus even talked about, that find themselves in this awful place but it's the very reason that Jesus came so that he could rescue us from that so that no one we love has to end up in this place of torment why are we talking about this Jason why, why is this so important why do we need to know this listen what you believe about eternity determines how you live today it's important important for us to grasp this and, and, and again if I were the devil I would want you to think that, listen, it's no big deal. It's not that, uh, it's not anything to worry about. It's nothing but a thing. Don't worry about, about hell. You don't need to, you don't even need to spend any time really thinking. It's probably going to be just a big party anyway. And my buds and I will go down. Hey, man, we're going to light it up. It's going to be great. If I the devil, I would want us to think that way. Now, I am completely aware that there are plenty of people who may be thinking, I, I don't know if I want to believe in a God like this. I don't know if I want to believe that, that there's a God that would actually send people to hell. It's really no fair, and I don't think God would, would do that. Listen, this is, this is a fundamental breakdown of our society and, and, and belief today. Because you see, God doesn't send good people to hell. We are all sinners. We all fall short. And unfortunately, we choose, by not accepting Christ, we choose our own eternal destination. And I, I'm challenging each of us today, not just to make that decision and that choice for our own lives today. But think about this, how we live may help determine how someone else decides to choose for their own eternity as well. Here's what we have to understand. God loves us and he wants good for us. He's a holy and just God, but just because he's just doesn't mean that he is not also very loving. He's not just just. He loves us with an incredible love, love that goes beyond what we could ever imagine or even think because there's not any of us probably here that would be willing to sacrifice own child for someone else but that's the very thing that God did for us because he loves us that yes he's a just God and because there is a penalty for sin and living in sin because there is and has to be that penalty and 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 God has to deal with sin appropriately which is hell, and we all deserve that. Thank God that he sent Jesus to remove that 
from us so that we don't have to go to hell. None of us have to. God doesn't want any to perish. Here's what we need to understand that He loves us so much. The scripture says he would, he would gladly leave the 99 and chase after each and every one of us who have gone astray, who have decided, you know what, I, I can't choose Jesus. For, I, I can't, do, I got too many other things. And we go our own way. We go our, our separate way apart from God. Here's the deal. Jesus, God says in his word that Jesus, he would leave the 99. He'll go and he'll chase us. He wants us to know him that much to bring us back into the fold so that we can know him. He loves us that much. Now, I want to read as I close here some, some scriptures. And, and, and if, you, if you've been around church very long at all, you've probably heard these multiple times. But I want you to hear them today like you're hearing it for the very first time. And if you're new to this, this church thing, grab a hold of these, understand these, realize what I'm saying to you and the, and the words that I'm reading to you right now from God's word. John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life with him. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned. We've all sinned, every single one of us. And the, the, the thing that we deserve is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He gives us his gift of Jesus, and we get to spend it with him if we accept him. Romans 5, 8, and 9, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. In other words, what we really deserve, we don't have to get because of Jesus. That's how much God loves us. Jesus paid the price he paid the price and the penalty for our sin himself so that we could know and see and experience heaven. Listen, Jesus didn't come for the righteous and the perfect and everybody that, that you know, does everything just right. No, he came for the sinners. He came for you and for me. He came for those of us who have flaws and fall short and mess up. He came for us so that we could know what true love really is through him. Here's what John 10.10 10 says. The thief, the thief, who's the thief? It's the devil. It's Satan. It's our adversary. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what God wants for you. He wants it so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we could know him and so that we could have the reward of heaven when we die. And that's why we, the church, want everyone to know this gospel message and to understand that there is hope. There is hope. And we can know that through Jesus. That's what we want to portray and that's what we want people to understand is they don't have to live with hell as their future they can experience the goodness of God and know heaven as their eternal